Our next speaker joining us from the East Coast is Dr. Lorian Urban, from, who is Senior Medical Director at Faring Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Urban. Yeah, thank you. So I think a lot of my uh, remarks are going to at least build upon what my fellow panelists have already uh, touched on. Um, I've spent my entire 20 plus year career in clinical research, primarily within uh, the pharmaceutical and medical device industries. And so um, definitely want to pull from that experience to talk about the risks and uh, liabilities from uh, an, an industry perspective. And then for the last two years, I've been at Faring Pharmaceuticals, which uh, is a, uh, has a core mission to develop therapies for reproductive medicine and maternal health. Uh, most recently, I have uh, led a program to develop a product uh, for uh, lactation to help women who've had uh, preterm births and are struggling with low milk supply. Um, so again, the core of our mission at Faring is to develop products um, for these populations. Um, now, that means that we've been able to embrace what I would consider to be the barriers of entry into this space because we are committed to it. Um, when I consider the whole of industry, um, I can uh, speak to these barriers and how they might be perceived by other organizations um, that may be less willing to embrace uh, th those challenges. So um, I would say uh, the, the barriers I think that, that folks face are, are sort of twofold, and that is um, uh, on the early uh, end of the spectrum, which uh, Dr. Bott had just touched upon, you know, you can certainly uh, perform the required studies um, in a phase one type of setting um, to prepare the way so that you can include uh, pregnant women uh, and lactating uh, individuals throughout the life cycle of development of a new product um, or uh, wait until the end and do that uh, in, in what I would call a registry style study. Obviously, the barrier to entry um, for including individuals all the way through development is a little bit higher uh, than a registry type of model after the fact. Um, the second the second point I want to touch on um, that that's been a barrier um, is is uh, kind of centered around uh, regulatory expectations for these kinds of trials um, and, and what it would take to bring uh, products like these to market. So, um, you know, for example, in our experience, um, safety follow up has been a big question mark. And the questions are, how long do you follow these individuals? Um, do you follow the, the maternal participant and then follow the infant afterward? Um, and it's not been clear so far. I think there's not a defined pathway of uh, what that looks like. Um, when uh, in the past several years, that has even changed for some of the development products that we've been working on. So it may have started off as one year and now it's gone to two years. Um, so you, you can imagine that that's a tremendous barrier to someone considering developing a product um, and, and wanting to sort of enter the market and yet being um, held to uh, a fairly long, long-term commitment follow-up of both uh, the maternal and infant um, uh, participants in that study. Um, that also has a bearing on when the information can be disseminated to the scientific and medical communities. So for any additional follow-up that's required, um, you know, there could be a line in the sand where you can end the study and consider the, the follow-up to be just that follow-up. Um, and so that you're able to get out as much information as possible in a timely way to the medical and scientific communities rather than waiting all the way um, until uh, the, the two-year follow-up of the infant, for example, is finished. Um, other, uh, other safety components um, are that uh, obviously there are safety events that happen within pregnancy that are associated with pregnancy or lactation and uh, not necessarily related to uh, the product that's being developed. And so I think it's important um, from that standpoint as well to distinguish you know, which is which, which falls into each each, each bucket so that um, like that's one way certainly to, to manage the risk is to sort of define ahead of time um, 
what the uh, safety signals truly are versus what um, is expected in the population. Um, so within that context, I think it would certainly be helpful again from a uh, barrier to entry perspective for um, companies who, again, don't have this as their central mission to lay out a more uh, concise and clear regulatory pathway for approval that includes um, pregnant and lactating individuals. Um, there aren't a lot of clear precedents to follow, um, and it would certainly require the engagement of FDA, we believe, um, to sort of define what that pathway could look like. Um, now, from additional risk and liability considerations, um, I'll echo, again, my fellow panelist, Dr. Bott, in industry, it's uh, quite standard to um, have in place a, a liability policy through insurance. And all of his remarks, um, I sound very familiar to me, so um, I will leave it at that. Um, one additional challenge I would say uh, is also something to consider uh, recruitment challenges. And, and, and that's another sort of source of risk that, that industry considers. Um, especially in acute conditions that are related to uh, pregnancy or lactation, it can be very challenging and certainly something we've experienced uh, quite recently, in fact, to recruit patients into a clinical trial um, so that we can have the data that's needed to inform the medical community. And with that, I will conclude my remarks. 